project solar arrays can have in replacing sort of the need for energy that um, sort of ISO New England says that we're going to run into. Um, you know, AG says no, but regardless, what does what do municipal projects have to offer? So I talked to Chris about Northampton because you guys do have um, such a good project going on, and I really just want to ask you questions about what makes a project like this viable. How do you implement it in a situation where you don't have such a welcoming atmosphere like you would in Northampton? Um, and then how do how do you guys see state and federal policies playing into how well a project can or cannot work? So I don't know if any of you three remarkably can speak to simple that. questions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, they're not. And that's actually what we've been doing is we're trying to, we have a receptive community and how, how we actually, first of all, transmit the information, not, not necessarily making it palatable how you communicate to the community at large to get by it, because that's kind of, that's critical, yeah. I think, as you said. Like it, I'm, I'm going to speak on the political side because that's where I live, but, um, you know, I'll defer to the other bigger brains in the room. The, we're fortunate here in Northampton and in this region to have um, um, the community actually driving the issue more than the politicians in respect. So the, um, Adele, who you saw speak before, has been, as uh, she represents a, a, actually a series of groups. Adele belongs to like more groups than most folks, but the, but. That, but that also represent and speak for the for the community and, and a lot in the Pioneer Valley about seeking out alternatives and also promoting conservation. So we got a decent start. You would probably how you would kind of get that kind of start in the community to be more resistant to it. One that um, uh, that's probably relied on natural gas for a long time, and it's been told that that that's essentially their best, cheapest alternative that they can have to, uh, to oil, say. Uh, I think you'd have a steeper hill to climb. And so I, I think, it, you know, there's education is, is essential and how would that, and social media tends to be the default where people go, but that's a lot of, I mean, because you're working in opposition to forces that are well vested in trying to promote these systems, yeah. and usually people pushing back or grassroots organizations that don't have the means nor the ears of many of the politicians who actually dictate policy. So, um, yeah, I realize I don't really have an answer for you other than find a place that's already amenable to it, <laughs> find communities that are amenable to it, and then when they when they thrive or they can prove their case in point in these service models, then it starts to become more appealing, I think, in a large respect. We brag to anyone who'll listen in, 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 in meetings or parties or whatever, I do anyway, and they, it's a quick way to be left alone if you talk about and you brag about um, we're the first five-star energy rated community in the, in the, in the country that um, you almost universally um, at least there's buy-in, if not genuine enthusiasm in this community. So, yeah, the, I, and so what I'm trying to say to them is that it can be done. I mean, if Northampton, an antique New England city with an, antique infrastructure, but with a political will, it's doable. It can be done, and there are ways to do it, and it doesn't cost their nose. We're not an affluent community by any means. And there, there, are, there is resistance, but the fact is it is certainly doable, and we've done it, and we are doing it, and are committed to continuing to improve it. So, there, I'll get off the stump. I'll add a little bit to that. I mean, even in Northampton, I think, I think it was very important that we had a public hearing, a public, uh, actually, it wasn't a public hearing, it was a public <laughs> meeting, um, particularly in the neighborhood that would be the closest to being impacted with the landfill. So we gave people a chance to come out and see what the project was, what's going to be, what was being proposed, and give them a chance to respond to that. Um, and then when they did respond, uh, we listened. Um, there were some concerns that 
there's no way we could do the project and, and um, you know, and, and not uh, end up having that concern happen to the person. But, uh, um, but they actually ended up walking away saying they weren't going to push the issue. Um, it, it, they didn't want to look at it, was basically it. Um, and no, nope, you're going to build it, they're going to look at it. You know? <laughs> it actually is our property and we can build on it. You know, there's nothing you could do about that. You know, any neighbor could do the same thing. Um, so, but, uh, but I think it was very important that we had the hearing uh, and gave people a chance to have a voice and were re receptive to listening to them. Um, and some of the DPW folks actually followed up with uh, the person who had issues just to make sure that, you know, to the best of our ability, we were going to um, address, uh, address their concerns. The second thing I would mention is you might want to talk with uh, Stephanie Cicerillo. Uh She's the energy coordinator in Amherst. And the reason I say that is that another, you know, pretty environmentally um, conscious uh, community that turned down a solar array. Yeah. So, you know, what were their, uh, what was her uh, experience through that? And right. they're going back out again for another one. How are they going to do it differently? So that might be a learning experience for that question. We're trying to look at the amateurs exactly to see what did go wrong because, you know, you, you, you think you have this sort of really amenable community and then there's such huge pushback that it doesn't go through. So what's what well, pushback's usually the butters and the, and I think what you're gonna find more often than not, everyone's very much in favor of conservation, carbon sequestration, uh, uh, they're concerned about the state of the global uh, climate until it affects your sight line. Right. Um, and you'll see that, I mean, you'll, this plays out over and over again, that biomass plant I talked about uh, uh, had a lot of flaws, but that was one of them, it was the community butter resistant uh, wind turbines, right. same, same level of resistance. You're going to see um, a hydro generation, same thing. The alternative generation systems actually have associations with it that everyone's keen on until it's proximate to them. Yeah. And what Chris said is actually helpful. If, if you plow the field early. Everyone naturally believes that there's some mass governmental conspiracy to make their lives a living hell, and so <laughs> that anything that confirms that, <laughs> thinking that it's being done in secret, and this has been done by governments over and over again, it's really stupid, because they want to avoid all the noise and stuff. If you're upfront and transparent in the beginning, just to have people have the opportunity to speak to the issue and express their concerns. And if they can see that their concerns in context, and that's what happened with the landfill issue, they saw the guy was complaining about a sight line, which was actually pretty minimal, when he also heard the testimony of all these people talking about how important this was. And I think in that sense, and suddenly it's, that thought no longer sits in isolation and just percolates, it's allowed to be expressed, it's listen to it and, and consider it, I mean, fairly, not just dismissed. It takes some work, and it takes some political work, and that's that's the tricky part. But that, I think, is, and, and you know, and it also, and unfortunately, I think in communities um, like Amherst, there, there were some people of means who had some resistance to it that actually made a difference. Um, unfortunately, you'll, you'll see nationally when there are, for instance, toxic landfills, they set them up next to communities that are completely disempowered and can't do anything about it or don't think they have the power to do anything about it. And I would argue that's partly why Springfield got a biomass plant because there wasn't the ability to resist it with the same amount of um, people power that they got in Greenfield. So those are the tricky, nuanced political parts. And they get even murkier too. But. I need to go back to your original premise, so maybe you don't want to hear this, but the, is the, are you asking the right question? If not the pipeline, then what? Because what I haven't seen talked about is if the pipeline doesn't get built, it's not just that a lot of gas-fired power plants are going to be starved. You also gain the, the avoided leakage through that pipeline. And I've heard anything from like two to four 10,000 horsepower compressor stations that would have to be built with it. Yeah. So this, the pipeline itself isn't an energy neutral, it carries some baggage with it. So before you do the equation, if not the pipeline, then what? 
first say, well, the then what doesn't have to overcome all of that stuff. So that, that's one. So the, the, the amount of solar you would have to put in yeah. to offset the pipeline. First, bring down the pipeline benefit to a real benefit. In other words, how many you know, million decatherms of gas it's really going to deliver net after all of the leaks right. and after all of those horsepower. And then you're passing off the cost to customers. That's right. That leaks. Yeah. right. That's so the, the, the position is McGovern does not want the pipeline. Right. He's firmly right. against this. Right. What he's trying to find is when people ask him that question, they're like, oh, you don't want the pipeline? What do you want? Right. So we're trying to find answers mm -hmm. for him. And again, this is sort of one of the smaller ways that we can look sure. at it. And then on the solar side of the equation, I think the, in my mind, the two big questions that have to be answered or policies that have to be addressed are the net metering that we all know about. Right. And then uh, I think carbon pricing is the only way to get these projects economical again. The developers are ready to go with, with some combination of tax credits, net metering, and carbon pricing. They can make these projects work in thousands of locations today. But we just had you know one of those three legs of the stools of the stool pulled out from under us, and the other two haven't been put up yet. So. Right. We need, we need something. The investment tax credits look like they're good for five years, but you know, there's a little bit of uncertainty on the horizon there. I, th I think the, the next sort of political wave ought to be carbon credit. <laughs> I agree with Jeff. I think that the temporally you have to think about the different stages of any project and what the different um, the opposition is at different stages. So, you know, using the landfill as an example, people are worried about the building of the landfill, how much that's going to disrupt, you know, how much noise there's going to be, how much traffic there's going to be. Um, and then once uh, Bill referred to the, the issues of sight line or smell could be another issue. So those are, you know, after it exists. So I think that it's, it's useful to think about addressing things in a, along a timeline. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing I wanted to say was something else. I forget. I'll remember and say it later. Yeah, I have some friends. Uh, have you talked with Janice and Steve and their their you know um, feelings about the pipeline? They live up in Warwick. And they're just friends of their people we know in common, and um, they have been talking to people in the community about what it would look like. And so, if Senator or if McGovern. Um, Representative McGovern would like to point out the same, you know, comparison to a landfill. Right. So the the width of the the burn that they have to create is so many thousands of feet wide. Right. The issue of leaks that will come up and the different fire, you know, equipment and this and that that has to come in is is tremendous. Right. The just the so all, all of those effects. So and then if somebody says, oh well, but I really need I really need the gas. Um, there are just so many other alternatives that they can use in their house. And uh, and the thing is, a lot of people who are in housing developments and apartments, they're not paying for a lot of their heat. So being more efficient is not not an option or or not a motivation for them. I feel like there's a, there are so many different things that that play into efficiency okay. and even insulating your house a lot of people don't even own their own house they're they're in these these buildings and then the developers are developing huge you know developments that don't include any solar that don't include any you know high performance type of insulated envelope or anything so it's it, it's how do you address those things I, I, I think that the, unfortunately, politically, the argument's always been framed in the wrong way. I mean, it's the equivalent of saying to someone, you should quit smoking, and they say, well, what's the alternative? What's a better alternative? Um, and, and I think that's to Scott's point is, and unfortunately, that's how, that's how lobbyists frame the argument. Yeah. It's, you know, okay, we'll come up with a better alternative. Oh, we, we do. We have yeah. demonstrable better alternatives. And the one that you're using now has so many manifested downsides that we all see in a regular time. We're, we're you know, we've 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 lost 
people's lives in wars and, and inflicted untold harm and damage to people to sustain a system that clearly isn't sustainable. So it's, it is like saying, well, you really should quit smoking. <laughs> it will kill you. And having them say, well, give me a better alternative. And you say a better alternative than quitting? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. But the fact is, is there, there, are, it's demo there are demonstrable systems that work that, with remarkable efficiency that are renewable, that have a, 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 a the, the impact is negligible. And other than sight lines and, uh, and, and the like, and, and I think it, it, I can understand the frustration of having this argument, the frustration we all experience when we watch these debates on television. We see a senator come in with a snowball and throw it on the ground and deny, and deny climate change. I told you it doesn't <laughs> That's right, <laughs> exactly. I mean, that's the baseline you're starting from. I think you need, you need incentives to, to um, for those alternatives is what the big thing. I mean, it's funny that we haven't actually mentioned cost other than the, the question around the pipeline. I mean, I think that what uh, government can do, federal and state government, is provide financial incentives. I think the Solarize program here in Northampton and all around Massachusetts has been a great example of how um, you do convince people to kind of get on board with something. You offer. Um, you offer the alternative with an incentive, a financial incentive that you know helps them to, um, you know, to, to make use of these programs. So, I think that you need the alternative, but you need the incentive to actually go after that alternative. You also have to address people's claims that there is no substitute to natural gas in some circumstances. They'll claim that, you know, what do I do to heat a building or my home on a cold, dark winter night when there is no solar? So to them, I would say, well, you need some storage for solar. You also may need some storage for gas. I have heard some people claim that we could get the equivalent capacity out of the pipeline by just repairing all of the nat compressed natural gas storage we already have in the state. The infrastructure actually exists to, and, and I shouldn't say the equivalent capacity, but the peak demand that's needed on the coldest winter night could be met with storage without adding any pipeline capacity. So that, that, that's a specious argument that you know, solar can't do it. Well, solar can't do it on a cold winter night, but storage could. One thing that, one, one piece of it, and you know, I don't mean to generalize, but I'm gonna generalize big time, <laughs> the, uh, is, Walk around a parking lot, how many big SUVs do you see against how many Priuses do you see? And, and I think that the part of, I think the biggest problem is that people aren't motivated and they're not willing to give up their big SUV for a Prius. And it's as, to me, it's as simple as that. I mean, there's not much that's easier to see than one person driving, you know, a Ford Expedition against one person riding their bicycle and people choose still continually choose the um, you know the, the the best selling vehicle in the country is a Ford pickup truck now. How many people really need a Ford pickup truck? And okay. so how how do you, so there's where kind of like a good example of what the whole alternative energy uh, movement is up against is the the percentage of people that want to drive a Ford pickup. And then, but Louis, I, I don't want to, I don't want to interrupt you. you only when you're done, right? I want to add something. The, the, um, the simplest, you know, probably the most, the, the biggest bang for the buck we could get would be energy saving measures, insulation, right. um, and, and you look at why don't, why aren't people willing to, why isn't it just the way of the world? And, and it's the same reason that, uh, the Toyota Prius isn't the most common vehicle on the road. People um, that don't want to pay for it, or you know, they want to see what what they're going to get tomorrow out of the money they spent today, and not down the road. Um, and you know, this is not to say that anything I've said, you know, helps you with the direct piece of it, but I think it gives you a, a, maybe another perspective on what you're up against. It's true, and what we found is the saving the world argument isn't that good of an argument overall. 
and largely you need you need to go back to what is it going to save you? How much money right. will you get for switching? It's the one thing you should take some comfort from is 30 years ago we'd be sitting in this room, it would be all males and we'd all be smoking. And there oh, are... Thank you for now. <laughs> <laughs> but the, but the, the fact is, is that culturally it's a slow slog and you know uh, Martin Luther King said the arc of justice bends slowly but it does in fact bend. And, and it, it's a cultural shift. It does take, uh, you know, it took government investment and buy-in to to basically convince the majority of people that we shouldn't smoke. Um, it would take some government, uh, as Councilor Klein said, it would, it would take some stimulus, some promotion, and understanding to the individual, that, as to Louis's point. Because, you know, we, we project upon ourselves all sorts of lofty ideals. But as I said, you're gonna run into, I bet you every one of those people who opposed the, the solar array in Amherst was all for alternative energy and, and probably opposed the gas line. Um, but the fact is, is that you have to speak to the individual, make them, and, and educate them, and, to, and, and realize what's in it for them. That tends to be it. Yeah. You know, is it cool? Is it gonna save you money? Is it, um, you know, I think, you know, if, if if, if I can have, if I can convert a wall into a battery storage that will basically ma make me energy autonomous, that'd be wicked cool, I'll do that. Those are the things, and unfortunately those are right now relegated to the wealthiest among us, um, not people with means. Um, yeah, until Kanye West starts, you know, conservative driving a Prius, I don't think you're going to see a lot of sway in some way in pop culture as far as that goes. Adele has something to say. Uh, well, those are individual measures, but getting back to the policy issues, you know, I don't know if you, if you looked into what New York State is doing, but it's so impressive. You know, they've set a goal of getting 50% of their energy from renewables by 2030. And the policies that they're implementing statewide just are just really inspiring. And one of my favorites is that they're requiring the utility companies. You know, utility companies are allowed to be monopolies, but that means they get to be then regulated. And so they're actually saying, okay, we are going to regulate you. And uh, one of the things we're going to require is that by June 1st, you have to submit a plan for how you're going to upgrade the grid to handle more and more distributed energy. Which, you know, just imagine the impact that would have to promote solar and, and also uh, wind. And you know, they, they have Hurricane Sandy, so they know that centralized uh, you know, power uh, doesn't work very well in an emergency. And we're gonna have more and more of those emergencies, and so they really wanna go to distributed energy production. And um, so I think that those policies that New York State is implementing are things that uh, are very inspiring, and I would love to see our state do as well. I do want to add to Louis' uh, point of SUV versus Prius is that when, it, uh, when gas prices go up, people start buying more Priuses and less SUVs. Yeah. So I'm going to go back to, to Scott's point, um, a, a carbon fee. Um, yeah. I mean, carbon pricing is essential and it's huge. It's, it'll push everything in the right direction. It's um, absurd that we're paying $2 a gallon. Yes, yeah. yeah, sir. 161. Yeah, one did you think about it? Just on that point, yeah. uh, Peter Kokrat um, needs some urging on the carbon pricing. If anybody in this room is a constituent of his would like to put in a call. So oh, wait, I, I better turn off the camera. <laughs> no, 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 no. no. <laughs> okay, I can envision a graphic in your capstone report that shows the pipeline in end view. Mm -hmm. You've got this nice round thing that could be a pie chart. Mm -hmm. And out of that pie of how many millions of cubic feet of gas it delivers and could deliver every day, how much goes to export? Right. Take that right off the top. Now, yeah. Arguments all over the map with that, but surely we could make them some reasonable assumption. A slice goes to leakage, and then you have to make up the rest. Right. So we've we named them all today, conservation and efficiency. Solar storage, gas storage, um, and you could probably get that pie chart from uh, uh, Massachusetts um, Climate Reduction Plan. Uh, that's 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 where Healy's got it. 
that it, it, it shows how we're going to get to the energy reductions that we need. Right. So it, it breaks it all down in percentages. Yeah, it's a good point. So you just have to convert those numbers right. into equivalent you know, size of right. gas. Right. Yeah. Been, uh, I bet you could get there. I bet you could get the whole pie chart covered. We were in a report um, on the gas permits in Northampton and pulled out uh, furnaces, boilers, and estimating how much more efficient the units that are replacing what's getting taken out. And I brought it to, to uh, uh, Columbia Gas and said, Northampton is saving a ton. Why can't we have at least a part back? Even if we got, if we saved a million, can we get a new connection for 500,000? And they said, oh, we'll think about it. But, but I wonder how so much. Run the moratorium yeah. before. Oh no! Since this is just since the moratorium, I think there was a hundred and seventy um, um, high high efficiency gas furnaces put residential and in a year in the first year, and then thirty odd um, significant commercial installations. And but I think that the gas that we're saving is probably going somewhere else. You know, to uh, and. It's, it was a little depressing to see that they're not even willing to talk about nuts and bolts about the existing infrastructure. And the, the argument the gas company advances, on the bumper sticker argument that they're advancing, yeah. is with the decommissioning of coal fire plants for uh, electrical generation. They need to offset that with more higher volume of gas at the expense of home delivery. So that because if we only have so much pipeline capacity, we can't get it. So in order to give you your electricity, we can't give you your gas for your high efficiency converted systems and conversions. And um, that's been held out. Um, I actually don't have the means to challenge that one way or another, but that is, that's what they're hanging their hat on. And that's what they're offering when they say, what is the alternative? We have no alternative. You made it shut down coal and you're killing Kentucky. And now you're you're talking about shutting down gas, which is, is supplied from the United States. It's not a foreign uh, fossil fuel investment. Uh, so give us an alternative. How do we power these power plants? How do we? And and to Adele's point is, you know, creation of microgrids and and and, and you know more autonomous systems rather than go to centralized systems. They're just reinforcing an existing system without much innovation. Because that's what they do. That's what their their stock and trade is. But the fact is, the resistance you're going to get is a corporate resistance, sanctioned monopolies that are allowed to uh, make money, and they do have some considerable political sway. And it ha the argument has to be appealing. It has to be made to appeal to the citizenry. Well, well hopefully, that's the theory anyway. That they they somehow. Uh, charge their representatives to act in their best interest. That's what I've heard anyway. One thing I'm struck by in this conversation is um, you might want to look at social marketing or to take a, a, a page from the playbook of public health, health promotion concepts, because it just seems to me as we're talking that different segments of the population need different kinds of messages and different kinds of messaging. So it'd be really useful to think about what those different segments of the population are that you need on board, including policymakers, yeah. and and figure out kind of what the messaging is that's convincing for the particular parts of the population. Um, and it just seems like in a report like that, you have to talk about that messaging yeah. and to think about it very kind of scientifically in that way. Yeah, that's the so that's the sort of my general field of interest. I really like looking at messaging and what it takes to get people to make some change or just to read a goddamn one pager. Um, so were we to have more time on our capstone, that's something I'd really like to explore more. I think I've run out of my time. Yeah, I think um, very it's generous. Been, I, I, I am. I actually gonna. I'm, I actually think I mentioned this when, when I met with you last time. I didn't have it written down, but right. I'm gonna try to send you some uh, info on uh, social marketing and, and messaging. Excellent. That's out there. Thank you so much. So I have okay. my comments are always done with Chris, um, and I'd love to talk with any of you if you have more questions or something pops into your head. We got cards too. So. Yeah, so I'll be here. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Lou. Yes. And I'll keep you posted.
Okay. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Okay, um, next up we had uh, LED street lights. Um, and I thought, uh, actually, I thought it was going to be me and Mary were going to come back and tell us about looking at three different manufacturers' LED street lights, so the ones that Siemens are, because out in Medford, Mass, they had demonstrations, both 3000K color temperature and 4000K color temperature. And the day before we traveled out there, their project got to that street and they replaced them all with um, uh, new LEDs, but they no longer had a, a sample of that. And so um, we did not go. <laughs> so you so, know the basis of comparison then? So. Yeah, it was like they were just, you know, on the other hand, um, uh, they, just, they just removed them from that town. And I wasn't going to ask this of them. I was going to settle in on, you know, basically look, look with them to figure out which manufacturer we want to work with and just get that sample in. Um, but since they did just remove them, they have to still have them in hand. Um, uh, I'm, I'm thinking now that maybe I will ask them to sort of install them in Hampton um, as soon as possible. So we can take, take a look at them. Why did they remove them? Um, they have the project moving forward, and the, they, they, they had them installed as a samples to look at. They picked one of them oh, to go with. Right. The These are samples only. Right, right. Which one did they pick? Just like I think they are working. I think they, I think they chose Acuity. Um, I don't know any any color as far as three thousand K. Yeah, three thousand K. Right. So, um, and we have gotten investment grade audits back. Um, uh, they're, Finally, improving enough that I, I'm able to work with uh, uh, numbers, but they are still sending me cut sheets for 4,000 K lights, um, giving me a um, product number for 4,000 K lights. You know, there's little details that these guys, I'm getting very frustrated with them. Um, uh, but towards this end, since we do have um, uh, good numbers on pricing now, I have spoken with Susan Wright, and just a heads up that um, uh, we, uh, she will be coming to city council for to approve bonds for a number of projects, LEDs being uh, one of them. So that'll be next Thursday, March 17th. Um, uh, so you guys can have a heads up that. And and you got, you already did approve a bond for this um, six months ago, uh, but at that time I didn't realize that we could include the non-city owned ones that we're going to buy oh. and work into this. So that enlarged the size of the project. That increased the size of the projects. Um, and uh, so the price has gone up. So um, you guys already had approved $700,000. And uh, so now um, Susan's going to come back in with another number um, that's going to be around a million. And yet I'm also trying to get pricing on the post top lamps that we have a grant for. So um, the grant doesn't cover quite all the costs of the post tops. And um, if they can give me the pricing in time, I'd like to include that in here so that might tweak it up a little bit more so that they would do the post op piece as well and that cost would get blended in with the whole um, uh, uh, payback. The payback at the moment is looking at about four and a half to five years. Um, okay, that's so great. Yeah, it's a good. And let me just clarify, not an additional million to the 700. No. Okay, no, good. no, no. It, it increases. harder to swallow them. Right. Why a bond? I thought it was a performance contract. It is, but um, uh, but still, we need to we need to pay them for it, and then the performance contract is it pays off the bonds. Um, the savings will pay off the financing. Yeah, that's what you. So they're not funding. Siemens is not funding. No, and if they were, then you know that would be we'd be yeah, it's got to be financed either way. But right, they're, they're not financing. Um, uh, so I think that's it on LEDs. You know, it's funny because the 3000K and the 4000K, I know that like 4000K was installed in, in New York and in Brooklyn, and uh, I was there about a month ago, and they're super duper 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 bright. Uh -huh. And uh, I was down at Ikea and I had to get a, a light bulb to just replace one last incandescent bulb that we have in our house. And on the package now it says, 2700k and I put it in and it was this nice warm yeah. you know you know that's that's it so like I know the 3000s are not as efficient or what have you but we can maybe work in our benefit I, great because uh, I think they're going to look a lot better okay. 
Now let me explain that really quickly. What I've been told by Siemens is that if you go from 4,000K to 3,000K, you do lose efficiency, but um, the energy input will stay the same. What will happen is you'll actually have a, a, a slight decrease in light output. Um, and, and from what I'm looking at, uh, the, 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 the way your eye will perceive the lumens that come off of these lights, um, the ones that are being presented are actually a little bit brighter than the ones, in some cases, they're a little bit brighter. For the residential neighborhoods, they're a little bit brighter than uh, what's already there. Um, it's kind of as low as they can get, kind of. So the fact that we would have a 3000K actually would make that look a little bit less, I think actually is a benefit. I would encourage that. I've seen the Brooklyn installation. Yeah. It is, it's so bright. It's yeah. hard to look at. Yeah, but it looks like the, and the 3000K, they still haven't shown me um, they, they still haven't provided me um, uh, uh, information from the Design Light Consortium Qualified Product List that the 3,000Ks are on that list, which I hear uh, both confirms that they've been tested and you're going to get what you pay for, um, and utilities won't give you a rebate unless they're on that list. At the same time, I've heard other communities have gotten a check in hand from, from utilities. So the utilities are giving rebates for these lights. Um, uh, but still, I am pushing them to give me documentation um, that uh, these have been tested by the Design Light Consortium um, uh, and that we definitely are going to get a rebate um, for these. Uh, so, but the 3000K sounds like they are there. Is there um, an option for a lower wattage lamp that would still maintain flow candles? The, um, uh, uh, I believe all the lamps that we're looking at uh, can be tweaked upon install. Um, so you can have them at maximum brightness, where you can say, don't set them down 10% or something like that. So, uh, so even though they're rated lumens, you know, might be a little bit too much, we should be able to oh, okay. turn them down a little bit. Okay. The only, only difference then is that you, you know, you're now using less power, but the way the rate structure is, you're, pay, you're paying in a bin, you know, one, uh, one to 50 watts, 51 to 100 watts, you're paying in bin amounts so that if you're rated a certain amount, you're going to pay that amount. Right. And if you tweak it down, you have energy savings. You have a better, you know, light that's better, but you're going to still pay the same amount. Yeah. Uh, so yes, we should be able to make sure we get the lighting. Um, you might have happier residents. Exactly. I've told them that. I said, look, you're not going to have people in North Hampton screaming about it being too dark. You're going to have them screaming yeah. about it being too light. Because <laughs> yeah, what so portion much. of the lamp posts are owned by the city versus national grid? I mean, is this? The poles, we don't own the poles. Um, uh, we don't own the poles, so we don't own the arms. My understanding is we can only put the bulbs in particular. I mean, I'm, I'm sure everyone on this commission already knows these things, but I, that's not true that there's some lampposts that we can actually put these bulbs into and some that we cannot? These are, what I'm talking about right now are the cobra heads, the ones that sit out over the street lights. You know, these aren't any kind of fancy, um, that's the add-on I want to do is the, the decorative post house, but I'm talking about the ones that um, kind of set up the street lights that shine out over the street. The fixture on the end of the lamp. So everything in the, the city, thing. though. Yes. And okay. And there are some uh, cobra heads out there that the city does not own. Someone might have it for their parking lot that they contracted with National Grid for. Um, so there will be still some out there that look like that's a street light, but it's not a city-owned product. Um, uh, Where are we at? Ninety. Nine percent or something. Of well, we, yeah, we own currently systems right now. But we're going to buy the last of them. Yeah. So the last it's like ninety percent. Yeah, the last ten percent, fifteen percent. We're going to buy them um, for thirty thousand dollars, and not back. Um, uh, uh, so it's a very minor amount compared to the in investment of the system. Um, and so we will replace every streetlight the city has. Yeah, every streetlight that the that the city pays an electric bill for. Will get upgraded. In what period of time? I mean, it must take a long time to get to each of these poles. Oh, right? once it um, uh, once the lamps are in 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 town, you know, there's the lead time of getting the lamps in. Once the lamps are in town, it should take about two months. They'll they'll go through the entire city and, and replace them. But I, I should give you a caveat. That you you would said that um, it could never be too dark for folks in Northampton. That's that some people, uh, we when Northampton actually cut back significantly on street lighting mm -hmm. due to uh, try, trying to realize savings, 
there was considerable resistance. And in fact, the precursor to this committee was a committee that was specific purpose was to address street lights and people would have to petition on three points uh, mm -hmm. for qualification for to to get a new street light. Um, it was it, there were tense meetings. So it's it is a change. The very nature of a change will prompt there won't okay. be how there'll be some hallelujahs, but those will be drowned out by the right. by by lots of other people who are going to be quite upset. Okay. And it will take time to become adjusted. And that's just to give you a heads up. Just okay. I, I don't I, want to rain on your parade, but it's no, like, it's Bill, point, point taken. But on the other hand, we are not removing lights except for in a few rare cases. So there will be a perceptible change for people, and right. that will qualify. And here in other towns, they're not getting complaints. Oh, good, good. Yeah. I hope you're right. Me, though, that maybe a little proactive promotion. Yes. Yeah. A little I public think, education. Well, we'll definitely have sample lamps. Even if we don't get all three different manufacturers, it's always been planned that we would get sample lamps in and that would be publicized. And that would be the time when we would say, this is happening, come take a look at the lights. Yeah. You know, um, uh, th this is what's gonna be going in. Um, and yes, we do. We won't catch people by surprise. Although, I've heard of a very successful program in Sweden that what they decided to do is try something for six months and then do the referendum. And they know it would not have passed before if they tried it, and mm -hmm. after they tried it, everybody loved it. <laughs> yes, forgiveness. So sometimes you say, no, sometimes you just go ahead and do it. <laughs> right, but uh, no, I think um, I think proactive communication is probably the better, the better bet. Quick, quick question: Are sure. all the all the lights and all the schools and stuff those are all included, even though they're not street lights? No. Um, uh, so public, I mean the city owned. The parking lot. Lights. Parking lot. Yeah. Lights. Well, park, parking lot lights, the ones that are, um, you know, the little decorative colonial or. I'm, I'm just thinking of ones. JFK. I was there last night for the band concert. They got a lot of lights around there. Yeah, those are on their meter, and uh, okay. we have not looked at those yet. Um, but we are very interested in looking at kind of one of the next projects is LEDs upgrades at schools in and out. Um, so. Um, it's now getting that LEDs are, are viable for indoors too. Um, uh, so that will be another project we'll be looking at. Any other questions on LEDs? Um, staff expenses in the Messi BE conference. Um, I managed to get a scholarship to this uh, Net Zero Cities Initiative uh, workshop. At carbon the building. neutral. Carbon, carbon neutral. neutral That's municipal, car right. Right, carbon neutral um, uh, presentation by uh, from Stockholm. Um, Sweden uh, and Cambridge Mass who has a net zero um, uh, energy plan out right now for their buildings throughout the entire city. Um, uh, fascinating, I don't have time to go through all of it. Um, uh, wonderful sessions next day on microgrids and batteries um, and on uh, energy efficiency outreach and education. Uh, so really worthwhile um, uh, and I would welcome a motion for uh, the mayor has approved um, my expenses for that, uh, which were $626.03. Um, and uh, I would welcome a motion. David, maybe you want to, you want to communicate with the mayor yeah, on this. Yeah. You know, we submitted it per protocols for the, take the funds from the revolving fund. The mayor approved it. And this is just simply a sort of a housekeeping measure for the commission to sign off on it. Right. So, um, motion to sign off on professional development for Chris. Okay, second. Any second? Um, any discussion? Uh, none, but if you could send us a copy of the breakdown. Sure. So, so, yeah. So, yeah. Okay, I get, I've got it right here, actually. Okay. <laughs> you, can I just walk over and show it to you? Yeah, that works too. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll check it out. Yeah. Sure, okay, yeah. great. It's, it's an eminently reasonable amount, so I have no problem with that. So. Okay. Any further discussion? All in favor? No votes. Okay, thank you. Um, that's all I have. So, oh, and Chris has assured me that next year he will be riding his bike to Boston. <laughs> Excellent. So, Excellent. Six hundred and twenty-one. Bicycle tubes. Bicycle tubes and all skins. Yeah. Just wait a minute. Just to, I have a couple things that sure. I said I was going to do last time that I kind of looked into. Oh yes. Um, okay. So um, let's, let's not leave yet. Go ahead, please. Yeah. Um, I'm going to 
the, the, the okay. one co are you bringing up his new business because it's, uh, it's not on the agenda? I just want to make sure if you just well, it's old, it's it's old, old business. It's, it's old business because she did take on something that she was going to do last time. Well, I'm just yeah, I'm just trying to make sure that we conform to the rules that we laid out. And it, uh, if, I can wait till next time and we can. Well, what I'm saying is you can mention it now for discussion at the next meeting, or you did discuss it last meeting, but it should be on the agenda in order to be discussed. Right. But we're not we're not yeah. voting on it. But it is new. It's Right. The public didn't have an opportunity to know. That's the thing. The public right. didn't have an opportunity to know that it would be discussed. That's all. Right. So, so Lisa, is, is it is it is it urgent to? I don't think it was time um, sensitive, or or is it? Nothing's urgent. There's one thing that I can send out as an email just to the group and to you, but yeah, we can wait. That that would okay. qualify the serial uh, communication with the committee. Um. Okay. Well, I think if we get sent out, but no one responds back, that's fine. You, right? it, it, it depends. Yes, if you're, if you're, it's a question of deliberation. If you are actually conveying something that we discussed and voted, then as an informational piece, that's fine. But if, you know, I, I'm not sure what the issue is, so I don't. I, I'm just going to be. Now I'm really curious to know what you found right. out. Read your can minutes. We, it's, 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 read, read, read your minutes. It says what you know, says the, Alicia and Bill actually were going to uh, do some research on right. the, the tricky part is the <laughs> yeah, open meeting law requirements that we uh, we seem to be the only community actually committed to abiding by it, right. but I want to make sure that we're we we don't violate it. So I'm in the interest of transparency, not in the interest of uh, of trying to squelch information. Right. So Alicia, I also want to apologize because normally when there's a follow-up like that, it should be on the agenda and I, and I missed it. That's okay. Um, um, do feel free to- It would be useful to have, if there's enough time in most meetings, to have a new business piece on the agenda that, so that okay. we can just bring up something for the, okay. next, the next meeting. I, I could do that, yes. And it's built into everyone, so it's it, basically it's implicit. So this would be a new introduction of new business for for discussion on the next agenda. Okay, I just kind of put that as a standing item on. Yeah. 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 Yep. Yep. We've never needed it before, but <laughs> I know. I know. Yep. We not all. That, that's fine. I, I'm absolutely all sub that. subcommittees of the city council now have to be declared as full council meetings in order to conform to the law. If any other council would show up, so this is not. This is a mayoral committee, so it's a little different. But okay. And um, really would. And I'll, I'll, I'll save it for next time. But discussions about what Stockholm presented and stuff. It was. It was, it was it was amazing what they're doing. It was just phenomenal what they're doing there. Um, <laughs> you could say you're suffering from Stockholm syndrome. <laughs> <laughs> Someday, Chris, we can go and brag over in Sweden. Oh, actually, actually, uh, one thing that he did announce is that um, uh, Stockholm is having a uh, a big environmental buildings, you know, climate change conference in October. Um, in Sweden. Uh, in Sweden. And people here are invited. So if you want a trip that has uh, some, uh, <laughs> wow.